Miami, 1966. This play in the final 30 seconds wins the game for the Miami Dolphins and finishes the worst season ever for the Houston Oilers in last place. A murmur arises in Texas. We've got to rebuild. Where do you start? You can look forward to the first common draft in pro history and key trades. But Coach Wally Lim knows building a winner in one year is more a dream than a reality. really begins in the hill country at Schreiner Institute in Kerrville, Texas, where the Oilers set up training camp. Glimpses of greatness emerge from the Oilers' youngest and fastest team in history. The first real test comes in the opener against the Kansas City Chiefs. The American Football League's number one team scores its first touchdown of the year, and the Oilers start this season in the back seat. But Houston has a driver who wants to get up front, Hoyle Granger. From the four, Granger again gets the call. Hoyle Granger goes all the way. The score is tied seven all. Kansas City scores a field goal to pull ahead 10 to seven, but Houston gets the ball right back and gives it to Hoyle Granger. Behind Sonny Bishop and Glenn Ray Hines, Sid Blanks gets the job done. The Oilers stun the experts by taking the lead. But Kansas City streaks back with two touchdowns to lead 25 to 14. Hoping to spread the margin, Lynn Dawson passes too near Ken Houston, and that's it. The rookie breaks free and clicks off 78 yards to the Chiefs' 27-yard line. The very next play, and quarterback Jackie Lee tries a short pass to Hoyle Granger. As the new saying goes, Hoyle Granger goes all the way. Another look at Houston's final touchdown shows the massive power of Granger as he bounces tacklers like rubber dolls. But it's too late, and Houston loses 25 to 20, showing promise. If facing the number one team wasn't enough, the second game is in Buffalo against the Eastern Division champs. Wally Lim's club must make a good showing or face another long season. Houston's defense rises to the occasion. The score is tied 3-0, but with Don Floyd and George Rice stampeding the Bills offense, any further points look hard in coming. Jack Kemp is almost trapped in the end zone and just misses giving the Oilers two points on a safety. The Bills' strategy is to kick themselves out of trouble, but they're only asking for more when they punt to Zeke Moore, a rookie headed for headlines. With perfect balance, Moore fights free for an extra 10 yards. 46 yards to the Buffalo 7. Butch Bird and Charlie Frazier matched head to head. The pass is a simple corner pattern and Charlie Frazier wins the race. The Bills, trailing late in the last quarter, try to play catch up football. It looks like Art Pal is wide open, but beware of Miller Farr. Number 33, W.K. Hicks is Pal's next adversary. This time, Pal doesn't even get near the ball as Hicks takes the Oilers to the Bills six. Find a crushing block by number 51, Ronnie Kavanis. Fourth and one on the one yard line. A minute to play. 
Boyle Granger all the way. Houston scores its first win in nine games as the effects of the Kerrville training take root. A seesaw kicking contest rages in Houston as the Oilers face their fourth opponents, the Denver Broncos. After losing to the San Diego Chargers the week before, Houston discovers a weakness at the quarterback slot. But today's chore is to beat the Broncos with what they've got. Denver leads six to three going into the second half, but a strong defensive rush forces Denver into a bad pass. Miller Farr is there to intercept and save the game for the Oilers. Houston realizes they must fill the quarterback gap before their next game with the New York Jets. Enter Pete Bethard. The former All-America from Southern Cal was apprenticed to Kansas City's Lynn Dawson until the Oilers made a shrewd trade. Bethard is the monumental task of learning the Oilers system after the season is almost half gone. So in New York Shea Stadium, Houston's defense will have to buy time for Bethard to learn. With a 17 to nothing lead, New York tries a field goal late in the first half, but Pat Holmes blocks it. The loose ball is picked up by Ken Houston. The rookie who was listed as the 214th draft choice proves that sometimes you have to dig deep to find gold. The 71 yard run gives the Oilers their first score of the game, but they still trail 17 to seven at halftime. But the first time New York gets the ball in the second half, they wish they hadn't. Miller Farr sets the stage for a 51 yard interception return. Houston trails by only three points. New York takes possession and moves to the Oilers 21. But Joe Namath's pass is marked for only one man. Miller Farr. The 67 yard return sets up Pete Bethard's first touchdown as an Oiler. Houston moves ahead 21 to 17. New York adds a field goal, but Ken Houston jumps in front of Pete Lamons and tallies his second defensive touchdown of the day. Score 28 to 20, Houston's favor. The Jets come back to score late in the fourth quarter. A two point conversion will tie the game. tied at 28 all. But it's not over. The last play. New York's Joe Namath goes for the win. But if he throws another interception, he'll tie the AFL record of six in a game. The record is tied. If Houston's W.K. Hicks returns more than 35 yards, the Oilers will break the AFL record of yards returned by interception. It's broken. Hicks laterals to Ken Houston. Who in turn laterals to Larry Carwell. If Carwell goes all the way, the Houston Oilers will win this game. The last defender, Joe Namath. Namath tackles Carwell on the three yard line and the game ends in a 28-28 tie. What looks like the two strongest teams in the East finish their struggle in a deadlock. Next stop, Kansas City, home of the Chiefs, who defeated the Oilers in their opening game. The Chiefs score a field goal early in the first quarter and kick off to Oiler rookie Zeke Moore. That is their first mistake. Moore becomes a streak of lightning for a kickoff return of 92 yards. Houston pulls ahead seven to three. The Oilers add a field goal. Then the Chiefs are shown their second mistake. Bethard fakes to set blank. 
rolls out and fires to Zed Blanks at full speed, who goes all the way. Chiefs coach Hank Stram has second thoughts about the quarterback he traded away. Kansas City's third mistake is trying a screen pass against veteran safety Jim Norton. The defensive captain scores his first touchdown in eight years of pro football. The Oilers have a commanding lead of 24 to 3. But then the Kansas City scoring machine starts rolling and steadily eats away at Houston's lead. By the end of the fourth quarter, the Chiefs move within six points of the Oilers on two Mike Garrett touchdowns. But then Kansas City makes its fourth and final mistake on the last play. They go for broke, and that's exactly what Farr does to them. The Oilers win 24 to 19. The Kerrville training camp is now showing concrete results. With a season half over, Houston looks like a contender for the Eastern Division title. It's back in Houston's Rice Stadium after a rain-soaked victory over Buffalo, a narrow win in Denver, and a heartbreaking loss to Boston. Mike Olivac's Boston Patriots are now at Houston to try and unseat the number two team in the East. The Oilers trail New York by two games, so they must take this game to stay in the race. Boston takes an early three to nothing lead, but Houston's Granger is unleashed in the second period. 67 grueling yards. Longest run of the Oilers' season. Bethard is starting to learn the Houston receivers, like Charlie Frazier. From the one-yard line, a tune opponents are learning, Granger all the way. Houston has a slim lead of 7-3 to three at halftime. Granger can take a breather while the Oilers' defense goes to work. Boston's pass attack is blunted by number 90, George Webster. Boston adds a three-pointer, but Houston scores two field goals. 13-6 going into the final period. Pete Bethard and company start goalward with a picture-perfect sideline pattern to Frazier. On the Boston two, Bethard repeats his famous rollout style and fires to Glenn Bass. Houston leads 20 to 6. The makeshift offense has come a long way. The Oiler defense, solid from the first, does not let Boston score one touchdown. Farr stings Boston in the final minutes of the game with his third record-tying interception of the season. The 27-6 victory puts the Oilers only one game behind the New York Jets in the East. Who would have believed it at the end of the 66 season? The welcome mat is out at Rice Stadium for the Miami Dolphins. Again, it's a must game for the Oilers. But Miami has never lost to Houston and has finally come up with a healthy quarterback in Bob Greasy. But Houston plans a Sunday dinner of fried dolphins. Houston opens with a running attack that is becoming the best in the league. Woody Campbell, number 35, has developed into an A number one halfback. And this 19-yard weaving demonstration shows why. The other half of Houston's ground assault is old reliable. Number 32, Grage, who goes, well, you know the rest. Miami's coach George Wilson waits for his offense to become on track. Bob Greasy is a mean passer, but Pat Holmes is an even meaner pass rusher. This is the result. But the Miami magicians come through and trail 10 to 7 going into the final period. The Oilers need an insurance touchdown against the explosive passing of Bob Greasy. Pete Bethard and Glenn Bass team up to drive deep into Miami territory. But on fourth and three on the Miami five, the Oilers gamble on the first down instead of the field goal. 
Bether keeps, but he stops short. Tackle Walt Suggs reacts quickly and shoulders off the tacklers. Bether falls forward. Did he make it? Yes, first and goal to go. The touchdown is supplied by the hard-driving Woody Campbell. Miami scores once more, but the insurance touchdown gives the Oilers a narrow 17-14 win. With a Jets loss to Denver, Houston is unbelievably tied for number one in the East. After a loss to the Western Division champs, the Oakland Raiders, the Oilers are still in the Eastern Division race, still tied with New York. But what an opponent the Oilers face today, the San Diego Chargers. Houston's last win against the Chargers was in 1962. But the well-knit youthful Oilers are up to the task. Pete Bethard's mastery of the Oiler offense starts to become a reality. Lionel Taylor inside the 10. With San Diego leading 7-3 in the second quarter, Boyle Granger follows Bobby Maples and Bob Talamini to put the Oilers ahead. Houston leads 10-7 at halftime. Oat Burrell, the halfback turned flanker, has his finest day. Inside the 10 again, and the Oilers press their attack. Not only is Woody Campbell a great runner and blocker, he also makes a fine receiver of Bethard's sidearm sling. Houston opens its margin 17 to 7. Houston's defense, strong as ever, takes its toll of the Chargers. George Webster. Only one man in Houston's defense plays the same position as last year, and the improvement is earth-shaking. Meet George Rice. It's the first long day against the Oilers for Sid Gilman's Chargers in five years. Oil Granger, the Oiler fullback, breaks the 1,000 yards rushing mark and tops Charlie Toller as Houston's single season rusher, and this is only Granger's second year. New blood pays off again for the Oilers. Bethard finds rookie Alvin Reed all alone. The touchdown proves to be the winning margin, 24 to 17. With New York's loss to Oakland, the Oilers take the lead in the Eastern race by one game. But there is still one game to go. To avoid any chance of a playoff, the Houston Oilers must win their last game against the Dolphins. Miami, 1967. One year after Houston's defeat in the final 30 seconds. Last year, it was just another game. This year, the Eastern Division title is at stake. The pressure is on. The ground attack is merciless as number 35, Woody Campbell, skirts around in for the first score of the game. The second quarter in Houston stays with a game plan that has already won them the AFL rushing title for 1967. Granger adds 64 more yards to his over the thousand mark. From the Miami 14, the Oilers keep their infantry in action with Woody Campbell breaking tackles like matchsticks. Campbell's second touchdown gives Houston a 14 to nothing lead. Now it's up to the defense to stop the gifted arm of Bob Greasy. And that's exactly what the defense is geared for, a la 267 pounds of George Wright. The Dolphins take over in the beginning of the third period. But it's the beginning of the end as Olin Underwood steals Bob Greasy's pass. Houston's defense says, now score. Houston's offense comes through. Pete Bether to Hoyle Granger. The long sought after balance between the powerful Oiler defense and its emerging offense becomes a reality. Granger gets the job done. Score 21 to 3. Garlin Boyette and the rest of the Houston defense can relax. Another Oiler interception sets Houston up inside the 20. Alvin 
Reed drags two tacklers to the one. Now the power play. Boyle Grage dives over. Miami gets one touchdown and a pass. But this greasy pass slips into the wrong hands. Ken Houston scores for the Oilers. A pair of field goals gives the Texans the highest number of points scored all year, 41. The young Dolphins can only put 10 on the board. It's only fitting that the last spectacular deed of an unbelievable season should go to the first man chosen to rebuild the 67 Oilers. Miller Farr makes his 10th interception of the year, closing out any Miami hopes and ending the game. The Houston Oilers, the Eastern Division champions, the Cinderella squad is the first professional football team ever to go from last place to first place in one season. No one would have believed it. Not even the Oilers, but the dream came true. The American Football League Championship 1967. The place, Oakland, California. The Oilers opponent, the Oakland Raiders. The clock strikes 12 for the Cinderella squad. In the first quarter, a strong Houston drive is heartbreakingly cut short. Pete Bethard's pass to Alvin Reed is complete, but stolen by Dan Connors. Still in the first quarter, Oakland's ball. Another if-only play. Ken Houston grabs the ball and has a clear field ahead of him, but he drops it. Houston trails 30 to nothing going into the final period. The only bright spot comes in the last quarter. Bethard to Charlie Frazier, but it's too little, much too late. The final score of 40 to seven is written deep into the Houston Oilers heart. But let's face it, the year was not a loss, but quite an accomplishment. There's AFL Rookie of the Year, linebacker George Webster. The whole defensive unit set a record of allowing less than 200 points during the regular season, and a new record of yards returned on interceptions. Starting the year with the worst offensive statistics in the league, the Oilers finish the season with the AFL Rushing Championship. From out of nowhere, a great halfback was developed, Woody Campbell. And the greatest Oiler fullback ever, Hoyle Grange, was only 22 yards short of the league's leading rusher and had a better yards per carry average. And last but not least, when an Oiler fan looks back at 1967, there's a little thing called the Eastern Division title won by a team that did the unbelievable, starting on the bottom and finishing on the top. For everything, there is a season. And for the 1968 Oilers, this season brings a new home. Wally Lim and the rest of the Houston Oilers will take up residence in what truly can be called the eighth wonder of the world. Even in Texas, where everything is big, the Astrodome is immense. There is no way of describing it that can make you feel its size. You can say a 20-story building will sit nicely under the dome. You can say that, but you cannot really believe the Astrodome until you see it. This will be the year to see the dome and the team that has grown large enough in stature to fill it. The 1968 Houston Oilers. <laughs>